Hi, I'm Dr. Jason J. Campbell, and I want to thank you for taking the time to watch my videos. In this um, video, I'm going to conclude my um, multi-part series of uh, qualitative methods research. Um, I've gone through, up until this point, four um, different methodologies for conducting qualitative research. Uh, those being narrative research, phenomenological research, participatory action research, and then grounded theory. Um, I'm going to conclude with uh, ethnography and case studies. I'm combining the ethnography and case studies um, simply because uh, I think the content information that I have up now is, is pretty detailed. It's very detailed for an introductory account. We're 50 videos in um, at this point. And also I've um, seen really, really good um, accounts on YouTube of case studies. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to link you to the accounts um, on YouTube watch their videos on case studies to get a more sort of comprehensive account and also ethnography so they're good accounts of case studies and ethnographies already on YouTube and rather than being redundant I'm going to just link you to um, uh, those those um, those accounts I think one of them is uh, Alan Bryman um, so when I get to the case study section just look um, click on Alan Bryman's link it'll take you to his discussion on case studies what they are so on and so forth it's like maybe ten six or eight parts um, and I think it's a, a very good account um, so I'm not going to go into too much depth and I'll be doing both case studies and ethnography in this section also as always um, the notes are available just click the banner that'll pop up or the link in the description field it'll take you to the PDF download the PDF and uh, feel free to follow along alright so uh, if I can get my marker working here yeah so this is an introduction qualitative uh, this is an introduction to qualitative methods research and this is um, 5.1 through 6.1 in the notes so this is section 5.1 through 6.1 Um, the first that we're going to discuss is ethnographic research. So let's talk about that. Ethnographic research. Oops. Alright, ethnographic research. Um, this is an analysis of the shared patterns of behavior, beliefs, and language among study participants, right? So what we're going to be looking at in ethnographic research, not necessarily primarily, but one of the objectives is an analysis of the shared patterns, behavior, beliefs, and languages. So we are interested in patterns, behavior, beliefs, and languages. All right. Um, an ethnography, properly speaking, An ethnography is a study of an entire, and this is a quote uh, from Creswell. Oh, by the way, um, most of the discussion is coming from uh, uh, John W. Creswell's second edition of Qualitative Inquiry and Research Design, Choosing Among Five Approaches. This is a SAGE publication, so this um, definition comes from Creswell. Um, where am I? Uh, ethnography is the study of an entire cultural group. So it's the study of an entire cultural group. So when we're talking about a, um, an ethnography, obviously you're, you're going to recognize that we're talk since we're talking about a cultural group and we're talking about their beliefs, their practices, their languages, um, we're typically going to have an N greater than 20. So you want to have an N greater than 10, 20, you're going to be interviewing uh, as many members of the population as, as feasibly possible, given time constraints, money, uh, and so on. Um, so typically, when we're doing ethnographies, we have an N. Your N is uh, larger than 20. Okay. Um, in ethnography, it's important to recognize that ethnography, like other forms of qualitative methods research, is going to be very intensive in the interview, right? There's a lot 
the way that we gain our data um, that we're later going to analyze is through interviews. Um, and not only interviews, but observation. In uh, ethnographic research, one of the key uh, components of ethnographic research, and not the, but one essential factor in it, is what's known as participant observation. So I'll write that down. Participant observation. Um, and, and participant observation is the observation um, of studying participants within their cultural group, right? What we're doing is we're looking at the cultural groups, the, the facets that we're interested in, patterns, behavior, beliefs, and languages, and we're going to be observing um, participants in that, in their natural uh, cultural group, right? So they continue their daily functions as they normally would were I not to be there as a researcher, and what I'm doing in their various forms of ethnographies. What I'm doing in one form is I'm just giving a very explicit descriptive account of what it is that I see. Participants do this, um, here are their daily activities, and here who here is who is in control of what function and so on. And so that's definitely one form of participant observation. Uh, again, I'm not going to get into the various forms of participant observation or the function that it has. It's just, you know, just very general account of uh, what participation observation is and how it relates to the, the, uh, the theory. The next is uh, immersion. Immersion. Uh, and immersion is uh, the daily or extended observation of group participants, right? I'm immersing myself within the culture of the people that I'm studying. And this is, it's important to recognize that this is to be contrasted against participatory action research, right? Um, ethnography and participatory action research share a similar frame framework, but they're different. In participatory action research, I um, introduce myself into a community and I become and participate with the community. The things that they do in the community, I do. The things that they learn in the community, I learn. The problems that they address, I address so that I become one with the community. In ethnographic um, and ethnography research, it's not mandatory that you do that. For, and in some forms of ethnography, uh, <clears throat> ethnographic research and ethnography can actually be detrimental. What you want to do in uh, ethnography is take more of a distant um, sort of uh, observatory role in looking at the, the various functions that individuals or groups of individuals play within their society. How that relates to their belief, how it relates to their pra uh, practices, um, uh, their language development, and so on. Um, this idea of immersion, we've seen a similar idea in the discussion of grounded theory um, when we talked about involvement. Involvement in grounded theory and immersion in um, ethnographic research is roughly the same. What I'm doing is I'm immersing myself, I'm involving myself in, um, in my research by, um, by living and cohabitating with the individuals that um, that I'm that I'm documenting or researching, as I said, this this level of involvement is drastically different from a participatory action research model, um, because in participatory action research model, I'm actually um, engaged with the community, um, attempting to help them, you know, figure out whatever it is that the problem might be. Um, <clears throat> so there's a difference, uh, a very a very stark difference between participatory action research and ethnography. They're not the same. Um, there may, I'm not going to write all of these down because they're listed on page 12. There are many different schools of thought when it comes to ethnographic studies. Um, and this list of nine or ten come from um, uh, Atkin, uh, At Atkinson, Atkinson and uh, Hammersley. Uh, this is 1994. Um, structural functionalism is a form of ethnographic study. Symbolic interactionism is a form of ethnographic study. I actually have done videos on um, symbolic interactionism, so I, I'll provide a link to that. Cultural and cognitive anthropology is a form of um, ethnographic studies. Feminism is a form of ethnographic. I've done videos on feminism. I need to um, make sure I give you the link to the feminist videos. Uh, Marxism, Marxism um, ethnomethodology, critical theory, cultural studies, and postmodernism. All of these are forms of ethnographic studies. Um, there are ways in which you can conduct research, let's say into uh, cultural studies, critical theory, even feminism, 
without it being an ethnographic study. You can do it purely theoretically. Um, so it's not to say the case that if you're doing fem feminism or you're doing Marxism, you're necessarily doing an ethnographic study. It's not necessarily true. You can do feminism, uh, 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 cultural theory, uh, critical, uh, critical theory or cultural studies, postmodernist studies. You can do all of this theoretically, sort of armchair theory. Um, however, there is a facet of it that is clearly ethnographic that's going to be sort of field research intensive. Um, and if that's something that you're interested in, sort of the field research practical, and then obviously this would be um, advantageous to you. Um, there are various types of ethnographies, this also noted in uh, Creswell. Um, confessional ethnographies, life histories, we talked a little bit about life histories in previous videos. Auto ethnographies, sort of self-reporting um, or group reporting. Feminist ethnographies, ethnographic novels, and visual ethnographies. Um, one thing that I do want to discuss, uh, because Creswell takes a bit of time to go through this, is um, the importance of what's known as realist ethnography. Realist ethnography. Realist ethnography. Um, and here's a quote. A realist ethnography is an objective account of the situation, an objective account of the th situation. Third person, which, which means to say that it's a third person descriptive account, right? Instead of saying I was dot, 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 um, I'm distancing myself from what is being observed. I'm talking about the participants um, as if I was not a part of uh, whatever it is that I'm ob ob observing. I'm observing it in the third person, right? I don't situate myself within the narrative. Um, the importance of a realist ethnography is that it is a report of the facts. It's very descriptive, intensive, right? So, um, it is descriptive. It is a report of the the findings, the facts of the matter, whatever that might be. Um, the researcher, quote, and here's a quote, the, um, the researcher has the final word on how the culture is to be interpreted and presented. Right? It's important. So the researcher has the final word on how the culture is to be sort of interpreted and understood. Clearly this is different from the participatory action research model. In particip and this is why I drew the contrast earlier. In the participatory action research model, the researcher, alongside the, the community of people, share, um, collectively own, if you will, the research, right? The research data, the research information um, is a result of the collaboration between, under the particip participatory action research model, is a consequence of the collaboration between the researcher participant and the participant researcher. It's not like this in, at least under a realist ethnographic uh, model. The researcher goes in. The researcher does observations. The researcher um, notates what, what she sees in the field. Um, she notates the facts that she sees in the field, and then she presents that information um, descriptively, right? Uh, and also in the third person, right? Sort of this detached narrator. Um, so it's important to recognize the role of a realist ethnographer. Um, the realist ethnographer being uh, different from, uh, distinct from, the participatory action research uh, theorist. All right. Next is what's known as critical critical ethnography. Critical ethnography, um, and this includes quote what's known as an advocacy perspective. And I'll write that down. It includes the. Uh, It includes what's known as an advocacy perspective. Um, when we're doing when we're doing um, participatory action research uh, and when we're doing ethnography, though they're different, one thing that they do share in common is the following: um, in critical ethnography, there is, and this is uh, uh, bullet point one, um, or I, there is an account of the marginalization of select portions of the population, right? There's, a, there's an, an articulation of marginalization. We recognize in the participatory action research model, and I went through and I talked about it at, at some length, 
how um, uh, there is invariably going to be um, uh, a hegemonic narrative of power, which is used to subordinate members of the population. What in the world does that mean? I talked about this before. Basically, those in power have created a narrative that some member of the population, they're, they're the underclass, they're the subhuman. They've uh, dehumanized them. They've depersonalized them, right? They, they've said, you know, they, they don't deserve, they, whoever these people are, don't deserve uh, to be included within society. They don't have the same rights that we, the privileged class, have. That's similar, right? Um, that account, especially when we're talking about critical, um, uh, critical ethnography, that account is the same in a participatory action research model or in, an, or in critical ethnography because what we're attempting to identify are marginalized members of the population, right? The manner in which we um, sort of uh, seek retribution for that marginalization or we seek to deconstruct or destroy um, that marginalization is different from a participatory action research model to an ethnographic, uh, critical ethnography. Um, the thing to recognize in the critical ethnography, one is that we have what's known as the included items. If I can spell it right. The included population and the excluded. And it'll be very easy for you to identify as a researcher who are members of the included population who are members of the excluded population. Um, the included population form the hegemonic power, right? The included population are members of the population who have been selected, um, who have been selected uh, as members who are in control of the population, right? Um, they might be the local law enforcement, they might be uh, represented in, in um, the government or in business, um, and their probably physical characteristics, the shade of their skin, the color of their hair, the color of their eyes, I mean, stuff as ridiculous as that. Um, maybe even the, uh, the variation in the language that they speak, the accents that they have, anything can be selected which privileges the included population. So the included population is going to be the privileged population. Members of the population that get privilege for whatever reason it is that they have it. The excluded population are obviously those uh, who have been marginalized, right? Those who have been selected to be dehumanized, uh, and so on. Um, this is a problem that arises uh, time and time again, especially in discussions of uh, hegemony, uh, and also in, st in, in, in uh, discussions of genocide. You can see that within a genocidal population, or at least a potentially genocidal population, included populations are going to be privileged, and the underclass, the excluded population, are those members who have been selected for extermination, right? Have been uh, selected for destruction. Why? Because there is the belief, um, and this is what critical ethnographers sort of um, fight against. So, if you're interested in doing critical ethnography or crit critical ethnographic studies, what you attempt to do is you tr you try um, to document the account of discrimination between those in the included population and those in the excluded co population. Um, and based on how involved, how immersive your study is, um, others might take your research as a critical ethnographer and um, decide to do participatory action research based on your ethnography. So you can see how there's a collaboration, right? Um, uh, critical ethnographer writes uh, a critical ethnographic piece and gives a very detailed um, account of the the, the conditions that members of the excluded population are living in, right? what they suffer day to day as far as discrimination and practices. And then someone who's interested in doing participatory action research might read that critical ethnography and say, hey, look what's going on with these people. The researcher before you who are doing critical uh, ethnography, they've detailed what the discriminatory practices are and what the structure of um, hegemonic reinforced power is. Why don't we go there and try and help these people out? Let's make sense of this. So you can see how a critical ethnographic study would um, contribute to participatory action research. They sort of lend themselves to um, this reciprocal research. Um, there, this, re this type of research um, responds and addresses many aspects of discrimination, uh, of abuses of power. 
inequality, I'm not going to write all these down, it's here, inequality, discrimination, structural violence, I'll talk about that in a second, oppression, bias, privilege, and the transformation, ultimately the transformation of um, the status quo. Um, in structural violence, the one thing that I do want to spend a little bit of time in is when we're doing ethno ethnographic studies and also participatory action research, which is not to say that you don't look for structural violence in participatory action research. As um, an ethnographer, whether you're doing critical ethnography or realist ethnography, it doesn't really matter, or any other form of ethnography, one thing that you want to identify, one pattern you want to identify, isn't typically immediately uh, verifiable. So, for example, two people are in a dispute, and one person hits another person, and you see the other person get hit. It's, it's an obvious form of violence. You can see that there's violent present. You can see that there are abuses and imbalances in power. Um, you can, you know, sort of assess and describe this abuse. It's, it's, it's much harder to be able to describe or to even verify structural violence because structural violence is typically hidden. And I'm not going to go and do an account of structural, structural violence now. That would require its own, its own video. But typically speaking, structural violence might unfold in the following example. Imagine that um, a husband and wife, there are two couples, and they're both eating dinner at a, at, a, at, a, at a restaurant. And one husband and wife get into a dispute, and the husband strikes his wife. Um, clearly, you know that him striking his wife sort of immediately necessitates some type of intervention on her behalf. There will be m many, many people who will stand up uh, I, I, you know, sort of damsel, damsel in distress, forgive me for the, the sort of sexist example, but I just want to be clear. Um, so there she is, she's been struck by her husband. That physical act of violence immediately warrants intervention. Simple. There's a husband and wife, they're sitting across from each other at a table, and the husband doesn't strike her wife. In this, in the second instance, he just gives her that look, like, you wait till we get home, right? And she cowers because of you know, the way that he's, he's looking at her. We might not perceive that, right? That, that, that stare that he's giving her is, is a threat. Um, and it is, uh, it, is, it, is, it is substantiated by the fact, right? It's substantiated by the fact that she knows that it's not just an open threat, that there is uh, the possibility or there will be the, the possibility of violence in the future, right? So she, she, she cowers. Right? Um, structural violence unfolds in many fa facets within um, various communities, uh, inequalities in educational opportunities, inequalities in access to resources, inequalities um, with access to power. All of these things are forms, forms of structural violence. And uh, the critical and the realist ethnographer, as well as the participatory action researcher, need to make sure that he or she, the researcher, is keen to uh, these uh, discriminatory acts, especially the critical ethnographer. Okay, um, there. In, in, in talking about critical, uh, not critical, but in talking about uh, ethnographic research, there are roughly six ways in which um, six steps in conducting this research. Very, very simple. As I said before in previous examples of qualitative methods research. I'm not in any sense suggesting that these steps are, are exhaustive. There are probably and definitely are more steps involved, but it's a very sort of general holistic account um, to uh, conclude this uh, ongoing analysis into critical uh, research methods. So these are six steps. Six steps to conduct uh, ethnographic. First thing is um, identify a cultural group of interest. Right? You want to identify the cultural group. And actually, I'm not going to write all these down because I have them here. Um, identify a cultural group is the first. The second is select an appropriate type of eth ethnography to use. Right? What type? What specific subset of ethnographic research are you going to use? Are you going to use a realist perspective? Are you going to use a critical, theory, uh, a critical perspective? 
um, and so on. So you need to identify a particular model and talk with your your um, your chairs and members of your committee to determine which is the best model for the type of research that you're interested in. Um, identify patterns within the group of interest. It's pretty simple. We know sort of the significance and, and, and now a little bit more systematically how we go about labeling. We talked about that in, in uh, um, grounded theory. Uh, we talked a little bit about how to go about labeling and identifying patterns, identifying redundancies in our data. Um, but identify patterns within the group of interest. Um, quote, this is a quote, select cultural themes or issues to study about the group. What is it about the group that interests you the most? Um, some ideas off the top of my head, um, and if these sound like they're intriguing to you, you might want to do ethnographic research. Um, you can do, and this is sort of cliche, but you can do um, rite of passage. Right? Rite of passage is always an interesting cultural phenomenon. How is it that um, young boys become men, young girls become women? within this particular culture? Um, are there, you know, what are the conditions that need to be met in order for a young boy to be considered a man? What are the conditions that need to be met in order for a young girl to be considered a woman? And so on. Um, in order to understand this, you have to immerse yourself in the culture and observe the cultural practices of individuals who have been selected for this. Um, and it can be very, very fascinating research. One thing that comes to my mind, um, I read a few years ago, I used to teach um, uh, a class uh, at the University of South Florida on this. There's a concept in, in a much, I, I don't remember which country in Africa, but there is the concept of outdooring, O-U-T-D-O-O-R-I-N-G. Uh, and I need to look this up. I actually should look this up before I, it's been a number, it's been at least four or five years since I've, uh, I've discussed it. But the idea of outdooring, um, to my memory, was a cultural practice that served um, as a transition from, um, from childhood to adulthood. Uh, but it was just like one aspect, one facet of it. So there are many, many different cultural practices, practices that may in interest you that might just be one, um, burial practices, birth practices, um, you know, uh, cultural inclusion, cultural exclusion. All of these uh, various forms of practices are studied under the scope of uh, ethnographic research. And if you're interested in a holistic account of a society or a culture's um, patterns of behavior, belief systems, language, and so on, uh, it's an ethnographic research that you're interested in doing, that you, that you should be uh, interested in doing. Um, identification of group patterns. What are these patterns? This I do want to write down. And I'm not going to write all six because I have, I have them here already. Um, group patterns may include the following. Group patterns may include um, the life cycle. And I'll talk about these briefly. Uh, various events. E V E, E V E. Uh, cultural themes. Hierarchical relationships. And group dynamics. Any of these can be uh, grounds for analysis in an ethnographic research. Um, the advantage of doing an ethnographic research is that because the group is so dynamic, because group dynamics are so large, and also because, by definition, these dynamics are constantly changing, um, there is a need for current ethnographers to revisit some of the cultural practices of the past to see if they're still intact. right? Because an individual did ethnographic research on a particular culture in 1960, and no sense means that the findings in 1960 are rele relevant today. Those cultural practices might have completely changed, especially with, you know, um, uh, the globalization of the world. Right? As globalization increases, cultural practices increase. As cultural practices change and increase, then it has to be the case that there becomes a, a transformation within how ethnographic research is conducted. So it would be very viable for you know, uh, 21st century ethnographers to revisit some of the cultural practices um, that have been documented already of the past and to see if those cultural practices are still viable as sort of um, as, uh, documented in the literature, right? Um, or do we need to rewrite the cultural practices of these different, uh, these different groups? That, that's uh, definitely 
um, uh, rele relevant research in a contemporary uh, analysis of ethnography. Uh, two last points. Um, the process of conducting field, re field work in field research is important, obviously. Um, like all qualitative analysis, you're going to have to do the field work. You're going to have to go out and do the interviews. You're going to have to set up the surveys. You're going to have to spend time at the clinics or wherever it is that you're conducting the research and talk to whoever you need to talk to in order to get your, your data um, in order so that you can, you can write up your, your final analysis. Remember, unlike participatory action research in, in uh, ethnography and ethnographic research, you, the researcher, are making claims about the culture. Um, you can be a member of the culture. It's not to say that you, cannot, you, you should be excluded from the culture. You might write uh, on the cultural practices of your own culture or you know, some, some uh, small segment of your culture. Um, but typically it's the case that you're writing a third-person descriptive account of the cultural practices of another culture. Um, and obviously there are, there, there are inherent problems, um, potential problems, in, in this practice because you want to make sure that you offer the best account of the culture. This is typically why it's done in third person, right? It's a descriptive, sort of fact-based account. As long as the account remains third person, descriptive, fact-based, there typically isn't any there typically isn't any problem. Also, if the, the researcher has fluency in the language, if there is a different language that's being spoken, there typically isn't um, uh, much problem. The problems arrive when, when um, uh, language barriers become a problem. Obviously, if there's no interpreter, you can't do the research. If you can't speak the language, you can't do the research. But also, you know, um, for an individual to become too immersed and for an individual to become too subjective in his or her research, I think I, you know, when I saw this, I felt that 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 that, that becomes problematic, right? That that um, loses the academic credibility. Um, it becomes more of sort of a narrative account. It becomes more of a a, a, a journal account than a, a, a science, well, a scientific, a socially scientific research uh, viable research project. So with ethnographic research, um, there are. Uh, constraints to the research, there are huge advantages. It's really the only research model, uh, or not the only, but the primary research model that exists for researchers interested in doing cultural practices. Um, and as I said before, one of the, for me at least, one of the biggest advantages to ethnographic research, it's why I read a lot of ethnography, I, I don't write it at all, but I read a lot of it, is that ethnography and ethnographic research projects facilitate in participatory action research projects. So it'll typically be the case that if you're really, really interested in doing and conducting participatory action research, you should be reading a lot of ethnography, right? Because the ethnographers are going to describe the problems, describe the abuses of power where, where, they, where they exist. And in reading ethnographies, you as a participatory action research theorist now have ideas. You should be able to generate ideas for intervening uh, and for assisting and for learning and growing with members of that community. So uh, participatory action research, which is what I'm going to be doing extensively uh, in the next few years, um, goes hand in hand with ethnography. I don't do ethnography, but I read it extensively to sort of get ideas for, um, for uh, theoretical modes of intervention. Um, so with respect to um, ethnography, as I said, I wasn't going to go into too much detail. I wanted to be very, very general um, account and uh, with that, I'm going to transition into the, the last, um, the last uh, discussion on case studies. And as I said before, um, my analysis of case studies is going to be extremely general. It's only a page long. Um, there are many, many, many different ways to do case studies. There are many, many, many different understandings of case studies. Case studies is a very, very sort of general concept. Um, there is a loose theoretical framework around case studies. Uh, I feel that others on YouTube have done a better job than I am interested in doing um, case studies. Uh, I think they have more expertise in case studies than I do. I know they have more expertise in case studies than I do. So I'm going to refer you to uh, those videos. I think I, I didn't write it on this version uh, of my notes. I think uh, his name is uh, Alan uh, Bryman. Uh, I'm going to link you to his videos, watch his videos on case studies. You'll get a really sort of comprehensive account of what case studies are. Um, I'm actually not going to write any of this on the board. This is the last page of the notes. Just, you know, uh, look at the notes and follow along. Um, case studies 
a detailed and in-depth analysis of one or multiple cases. You can have case studies that are multiple cases. Typically, case studies are one case, um, though they can be multiple cases. Um, a single is uh, one case within a study, right? So a single case study is one case within the larger framework of some theoretical study. Multiple means, obviously, that there are more than one case that's being studied within uh, a specific study. Um, and then what I want to do is talk about the six different forms of case study. Uh, again, I'm not going to discuss this now. Um, since we know that you have single or multiple, you have what's known as single exploratory, single descriptive, single explanatory, multiple exploratory, multiple descriptive, and multiple explanatory. I'll leave all of that um, for you to read. Um, I subsidize a lot of this information with um, Creswell's text, Qualitative Inquiry and Research Design, and also um, uh, uh, Robert K. Yin's Applications of Case Study Research. So with the notes that I have up and the links that I've provided to um, the other videos on YouTube, plus you know that the major research that sort of governed this brief page of notes came from Robert K. Yin. You can sort of Google him and, and find his book and, you know, get it for yourself. And I'll have all of this information in the description field. Um, you should have enough uh, to understand what case studies are. Again, I'm not going to go too much into case studies. Um, which is not to say that it's not important. I know I've spent, you know, two hours, uh, two hour, at least two hours on each segment of the, the previous four um, concepts. But for me, I feel that um, case studies, ethnography, uh, you really, ethnographies, ethnographies are something that researchers are going to do, especially in qualitative research. I see a lot of, I see a lot of uh, research into ethnographies and case studies. Um, uh, and I think that they they hold they hold a lot of promise for further academic research. Um, the way that I use ethnographies um, is, and I don't really use case studies because I'm a theorist, I'm a philosopher. So case studies really don't have too much application for me as a philosopher. They have incredible application, but theoretically, I'm more interested in in creating theory, uh, grounded theory. Uh, it interests me quite a bit. Um, phenomenological theory interests me. Uh, a whole lot. So the presentation of information is obviously biased by my own interests, which is not fair, I guess. Um, but case studies and uh, ethnographies, as I said, I'll provide you with links if you want to get more information. Um, and with that, I want to thank you for taking the time to watch these many, many hours of videos on uh, an introductory account into various methods of qualitative research. This will conclude um, my analysis into the various methods of qualitative research. Um, I've discussed narrative research, again, um, uh, phenomenological research, participatory action uh, research, grounded theory, briefly talked about uh, ethnographies, and uh, just a bit on case studies with links and references to more information on case studies. And that's, uh, that completes it. So with that being said, thanks again. I'm Dr. Jason J. Campbell. Goodbye.